Okay, so our, our first speaker is uh, Duncan England. Uh, he, uh, he's English. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Durham University. In fact, just 45 minutes ago, I said, uh, Durham, where is it? Is, is, it, is it in England or in Scotland? Uh, the answer, of course, is that it's in uh, North Carolina, but that's, but that's a different story. <laughs> So uh, he, he did his undergraduate work at Durham University, uh, uh, then went to uh, University of Oxford and became very interested in uh, uh, quantum optics uh, and quantum information. Uh, then uh, came to Ottawa to take a position at the National Research Council of Canada, and he's been there ever since. He, he likes it here in Ottawa, and who wouldn't like it here in Ottawa? <laughs> okay, so Duncan, please take over. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Boyd, for the, uh, the kind introduction and to you and to Professor Hawkins for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times that this is the 11th uh, symposium, and, and I actually remember the first one very well because uh, I'd only been in Ottawa a matter of a handful of weeks. Uh, and I, I, remember, I remember thinking to myself what a great community it was that I'm joining, and, and uh, certainly nothing that's happened in the, in the intervening 10 years has made me change my mind on that. So it's a real honor to be able to, to talk today. Um, or hopefully to be able to talk today. Um, so uh, I think I must have been in a kind of historical frame of mind when I, when I wrote this talk. Um, and, and so I decided to talk about something which I've worked on pretty much my entire time at, at the National Research Council, which is, which is quantum memories. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure I can fill an hour on quantum memories without some slides, but I, I, could, I could certainly try. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think bec yeah, because of this uh, historical perspective, maybe a more appropriate title for today's talk would have been a, a walk down quantum memory lane. Uh, and I, I would like to promise that will be the only bad joke in today's talk, but I, I certainly can't make that guarantee. Um, but uh, I think the uh, the formal title is at least useful because. Uh, if I, in the introduction section, if I can get you to understand what all of those words in the, in the title mean, uh, then we'll, 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 have, uh, we'll have done well. Uh, so first of all, what is a quantum memory? Well, a quantum memory is a device which stores a single photon and retrieves it on demand. So what I'm trying to do is put this single photon here into this black box. It'll stay there for, for some time, and then at the press of a button, in this case, literally at the press of a button, uh, the single photon will leave the quantum memory. Uh, now, if you, if you ask anyone on the street what they know about quantum mechanics, of course, it's, it's Schrodinger's cat, which is that you can't, you, know, you can't make a measurement on a quantum system uh, without affecting the, the system. And so that obviously introduces a challenge for quantum memory because what you're trying to do is you're, you're, you're trying to um, store this single photon, but you're trying to do it in such a way that doesn't affect it or doesn't make a measurement upon it. Uh, and, that, and that's the real challenge. And of course, it goes without saying there is no such black box, uh, as, as what I've had on the slide here. And if there was, this would be a very short and very boring talk. Uh, what there is, is there's a, a series of devices uh, which approximate this black box, and they all have different properties and, and uh, different pros and cons. Uh, and so when you're thinking about these, uh, it's important to, to think about what kind of metrics you're interested in. You know, how, how do you judge whether you have a good quantum memory or not? So the, probably the first and one of the most important things you think about is the efficiency. You know, how efficiently does a, a photon get mapped into the memory and then, and then back out again? Uh, and there's also the storage time. So if, if, I'm try, if I put a, successfully put a photon into the memory, uh, how long does it stay there before it gets lost by, by some mechanism? So we, we call this the storage time. Uh, and then there is the, the bandwidth of, of the light that can be stored, which is, is of course, intimately related to the, the temporal duration. Uh, and then you can, you can think about the, uh, what's called the time bandwidth product, which is basically the, the, the product of the previous two. Uh, okay, is that, is that better? Can people hear me? This is like being on Zoom again. Um, so, uh, and then there's the product of, of those two things, which is the time bandwidth product, which, uh, or which you put another way, you know, how many pulses can I store inside of the quantum memory? So the shorter the pulse, the, the higher this number is, and also the longer the storage time, the, the higher the number is. Um, and then you need to worry about noise. It, it's, uh, in most of these systems, you, you are introducing a little bit of, of background noise when, when you do this. Um, and then there's also the, the question of coherence or indeed decoherence uh, when the, the information that you're trying to store can, can degrade over the course of the storage time. Uh, and then there's slightly more boring and technical considerations like the size, cost, weight, complexity, et cetera, of, of the device. So it's important to keep all these things in mind and then, you know, depending on the, 
on the system. You, some, some of these properties may be, be better than others, so you need to think about what it is exactly you want to do with, with the memory. Uh, now the reason I, I got interested in, in this stuff, you know, 10 years ago or more than 10 years ago now, is I think there's some very interesting you know, foundational physics going on, um, you know, light matter interactions, particularly light matter interactions at the, uh, at the quantum level. And of course, there's, there's nonlinear optics, atomic physics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is kind of the, the foundation for, for a lot of the applications that, that you can use quantum memory for. Uh, probably the, uh, the most famous, or at least the most commonly imagined use of a quantum memory is, is a part of what is called a quantum repeater. And these things are seen to be kind of key to the success of uh, long-range, ground-based at least, uh, quantum key distribution. And they play an analogous role to, um, to regular repeaters in classical communication in which they, uh, they, they store the single photons and, and allow repeat until success strategies to, to bridge large distances in optical fiber. Uh, and for this kind of application, uh, obviously long storage time and high efficiency is absolutely key. Uh, there are also a series of what I've called uh, unconventional applications. Um, and you know, th these, these can, can range from synchronizing single photons for, uh, uh, sorry, synchronizing multiple single photons for, for quantum processing applications, uh, memory-based nonlinearities. You can even think about doing uh, rudimentary quantum processing inside of a quantum memory, frequency manipulations, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Kabat and I and, and, a, and several other colleagues wrote this review article on it a few years ago. Uh, and the point about these more unconventional applications is that they don't necessarily require a long storage time. But what is more important is the, uh, the, apps, uh, the, um, the, the, the ratio of the storage time to the pulse duration, or, or put another way, how many operational time things one can access inside of the memory. Uh, and we're mostly going to be talking uh, about these type of memories today uh, that have the sort of shorter storage times and, uh, and higher bandwidth. Uh, so well, what do I mean by a, a, a broadband quantum memory? Well, I, I mean a memory that can store uh, single photons whose, uh, whose bandwidths are roughly, you know, let's say, 10 gigahertz to terahertz, or put another way, you know, hundreds, hundreds of femtoseconds to, to picoseconds, that, that kind of time scale. So why, why are we interested in doing that? Well, um, as I touched on before, shorter pulses allow many operational time bins inside of the, uh, inside of the storage time. And this actually has a, another important uh, ramification which is that if, because if you're working at room temperature as opposed to cryogenics or ultra-cold atoms, then these, these things tend to decohere pretty quickly. But by working with ultra-fast pulses, um, you can still do a, a bunch of useful operations inside of the, the decoherence time. So, so basically working fast allows you to avoid cryogenics. Um, now what broadband quantum memories are also compatible with some of the widely used uh, single and, and entangled photon sources, such as uh, trans spontaneous parameter down conversion, spontaneous forward mix mixing, et cetera. Uh, and then the final and perhaps most important reason is, is that when, when you're in Ottawa, you have to do as the Ottawans do. Uh, so with, with people like uh, Bob and Paul and, and David and Albert and, and many others at NRC and at University of Ottawa working on ultrafast lasers, of course I, I, I have to do the same thing. Um, and there's, I think there's, there's actually a more serious point to be made here, which, which is that you know, the, the Ottawa community with the, the expertise in ultrafast optics and, and quantum optics makes it kind of a, the perfect place to do this kind of research, and that's why I've been very lucky to be here for the last decade. Um, so what I mean by, by protocols, well, I could probably give a whole lecture series about, about these, which I, which I won't, don't worry. Um, but it, to me, it all started off with, with slow light or electromagnetically induced transparency. Um, and then from, from that, a bunch of different uh, quantum memory protocols exploded, including atomic frequency cones, gradient echo memories, um, the RAM and memory, et cetera. And, and what, the, the way all of these work is that you, you take a photon and you map it to some kind of material excitation, an, an excitation of, a, of an atom or an ensemble of atoms or rare earth ions or something like that. Um, uh, and then there's a, a couple of other kind of strategies where you, you don't map the, uh, the photon into a material excitation, you simply store it in some kind of uh, ring cavity. Uh, so that was done by, uh, by Paul Quiet's group in Illinois and, uh, and also uh, Christina Silverhorn in, in Paderborn. Uh, and then you, you can also do what we, what we do in Ottawa, which is this nonlinear optical cavity switching. Um, so I'm today going to be focusing on the Raman type memory, uh, and then as the second part of my talk, I'll be talking about the, the cavity switching. Uh, so that's what I mean by the protocols. And when I mean platforms, I, I just mean physically, you know, what, what kind of system are we using to store? So as, as I touched on on the previous slide, there's a lot of atomic systems used for quantum memories, either single atoms, ensembles of ultra-cold atoms, warm atoms, rare earth ions, et cetera, et cetera, and also these free space and fiber integrated cavities. 
to her, and today we'll be, doing, we'll be talking about uh, some bulk crystals, which for the first half of my talk and the uh, optical fiber cavities for the second half. So that's kind of a, a, an outline for the next uh, half hour or so. So I'll start off by telling you about the diamond quantum memory that we developed here, uh, where we stored single photons uh, by converting them into single phonons in, uh, in, in diamond. And here the, the photon duration is about 200 femseconds or so, uh, and the memory lifetime is three and a half picoseconds. Uh, and that's another advantage of working in Ottawa. If you, if you tell someone from anywhere else that you've got a memory that's three and a half picoseconds long, they kind of laugh at you. But in Ottawa, three and a half picoseconds is actually quite a long time. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another advantage of working here. Um, and then I'll move on to talking about a, a new protocol that we developed here in Ottawa, uh, which is called Storage with Intracavity Frequency Translation, or, or SWIFT. Uh, and here the, the lifetime is much more reasonable, uh, sort of several microseconds or so, and the pulse durations are also longer, so 10 picoseconds or so. Uh, so beginning with, with a diamond, a, little, a quick sort of primer for you. Uh, the, uh, the crystalline structure of diamond basically looks like two face-centered cubic lattices, which are sort of overlapping with each other. Uh, I've drawn them in red and blue here for illustration purposes. Of course, they're all carbon atoms, so, so they're the same. Uh, and the diamond exhibits two distinct kind of, kinds of phonons. The first is an acoustic phonon, which is basically a displacement of, of the atoms from their equilibrium position. Uh, and they're called acoustic phonons because they, they propagate in the same way that, that sound waves do. Um, and then the other type, which, which we're going to be talking about today, are called optical phonons. Uh, and they're, they're known as optical phonons because they can be excited by two photon Raman transitions, as shown in the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom right there, or bottom left if you look at it. Um, and these have a very well defined frequency uh, of, of 40 terahertz, uh, and they decay into a pair of optical, uh, sorry, of acoustic phonons with a lifetime of three and a half picoseconds. And that's the, the lifetime that, that dictates the, uh, the storage time of, of the memory. So the, uh, the memory protocol kind of proceeds like this. You, you, you have the, the ground state and the optical phonon, um, which are separated by 40 terahertz, as I mentioned. Uh, and then you apply a single photon in blue there, uh, which is in two photon Raman resonance with, the, with a strong, uh, what we call a right pulse. Uh, and you can see that the, the, ah, okay, I shouldn't have pressed that, sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right, no laser pointers for today. Uh, any idea how I get that back? Perfect, thank you. Um, sorry, not press that one again. Um, and, uh, and so, you, yeah, you apply them in two photon resonance, but the, the point I was trying to make when I messed the slides up is that the, uh, the you're in two photon resonance with the, with the two ground states, but you're a long way off single photon resonance with the conduction band. Uh, and this is, this is important because it allows you to, to, uh, to use high bandwidth pulses and high bandwidth photons. Um, so then, then the, the single photon is absorbed into the optical phonon, so you, you, you absorb the one photon and generate one phonon. Um, and then sometime later, some short time later, you come in with a, uh, a second strong pulse, which we call the read pulse, uh, and that emits the single photon and, and, uh, and annihilates the, the phonon. Um, and so this, this is how the, the, the quantum memory works. And I wanted to just emphasize it's a really, it's a very simple physical system. Uh, it's a roughly two millimeter thick diamond um, manufactured by chemical vapor de deposition. And it's just at room temperature sitting in an optics mount in the lab. Uh, so I'll walk you through the, uh, the process, the way it works. So the, uh, the selection rules for, uh, for Raman excitation of the, uh, of the phonon dictate that the, the two fields have to be orthogonally polarized. So we start with uh, a vertically polarized right pulse and a horizontally polarized single photon. And you scan the arrival time delay uh, with respect to each other, and you see this, this dip here of around 20%, um, showing that the, the photons are being absorbed and the phonons are being generated. Uh, and the width of that <coughs> dip combined with the autocorrelation of, the, of the, the right pulse tells us that the photon duration is, is of the order uh, 200 femseconds, as I said. Next, you come in with a horizontally polarized uh, read pulse. And what that does is generate a vertically polarized right pulse, uh, uh, sorry, vertically polarized output single photon. Uh, and then as you scan that delay relative to the input, you, you can see this, this exponential decay as you would expect uh, with a lifetime of three and a half picoseconds. Uh, and there's noise that's generated by a couple of different mechanisms, but in this case, it's dominated by just spontaneous Raman scattering, spontaneous anti-Stokes Raman scattering. Um, nevertheless, we can store the single photons for about 13 times the, the pulse duration uh, with a signal to noise ratio of uh, about four to one. Um, so I've been talking a lot about single photons. Uh, how, do we, how do we know that the photons are truly single photons? Well, um, this is probably a, a slide that's familiar to many of you that work in quantum optics, but, but the way that the, the sort of characteristic, if you like, of single photons is that they, they can't be divided. You can't split a single photon in half. 
So the way you, you do this is you, you fire a single photon at a beam splitter and you measure them on detectors one and two. You look for coincident detections between, between one and two. Um, and of course, a single photon should never be coincidentally detected at one and two. And you, you quantify this with the, the so-called G2 function, which is basically the, the ratio of the, the probability of, of a um, coincident detection divided by the product of the two individual probabilities. Um, so for a single photon, this is obviously zero because you, you never have uh, coincident detections. But if you have a, a coherent state, for example, it's just an attenuated laser, uh, then there is a chance that you can make more than one photon at once. Uh, and it turns out that the probability of coincident detection is just, is just given by the, the individual um, probabilities multiplied by each other, and therefore that the G2 is exactly one. So this is a, this is a nice metric for, for basically determining how, how what the single photon nature of your, um, of your source. And in our case, we, we did a pretty good job, so the G2 is 0.04, so it's pretty much a, a perfect single photon. Uh, then the question is, well, yeah, what happens when I stick this into a quantum memory and get it out again? Uh, am, I, uh, am I messing this up? Well, we end up with a G2 of, of 0.65, so it, it is, it's not zero anymore, um, but it is still significantly less than one. Um, and the reason why it increases is, is, of course, because of these noise photons, which I've, which I've colored in, in red up there. Um, Unfortunately, they're not a different color, otherwise we really could get rid of them, but they, they, are, they are the same color. Um, uh, and th that just increases the, the probability of two photon detection and, and pollutes the single photon uh, nature of the output. But nevertheless, we, yeah, we do have a non-classical measurement of the, the photon statistic, and that persists for around about three picoseconds of, of storage time. Um, so yeah, the memory preserve is the, the, the characteristics. So I, I wanted to just wrap up this little section with, with a, a small cartoon. So. What we're doing is we're, we're focusing a, uh, a single photon into a, into a little pencil of diamond that's about two millimeters long, 100 microns in diameter. Uh, and that contains about 10 to the 17 atoms. And somewhere in there, there's a little phonon buzzing around. Um, we, don't, we don't know where. And in fact, you know, we don't know where. And the universe doesn't know where because it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually this phonon is delocalized across all 10 to the 17 atoms. And my, my PowerPoint skills certainly don't extend to, to illustrating that. Um, and this is known as, as a Dickey state. Uh, and then sometime, sometime later, we, we get a single photon out. And, and because we measure the single photon to have non-classical photon statistics, we know that we must have made a single phonon inside of the diamond. Although, of course, we have no way of measuring it without, without a very good microphone or something that could, that could measure the, the phonon. Uh, so that's how we know what kind of state we've made inside of the lattice. Um, well, it, I guess, you know, then the, the question that is probably reasonable to ask at this stage is, you know, what, it, what, what is the use of a, a quantum memory whose, whose lifetime is, you know, 12 orders of magnitude less than the average goldfish? Um, and I, I think uh, I want to start talking about some of the applications that, that one can use this for. Uh, and I'll start with uh, this idea that it can be used to, to build reconfigurable optical components. Um, so I'll start with, you know, talking about what a beam splitter is. I, I think this audience probably doesn't need this slide, but a, a beam splitter is... Uh, is a partial reflector that basically transmits t percent of the light that is incident upon it and reflects r percent, and, and this ratio is, is, is fixed, uh, you know, at the stage that it's manufactured. Now, you can think of of a quantum memory as a beam splitter, and in fact, a lot of the, the mathematics is the same. Um, but in this case, what you're doing is you're, you're bringing in from the bottom a, an optical field, and then at, at the beam splitter, uh, then the the optical field is is split between transmitted light that continues straight through the beam splitter uh, and a, a storage mode, in, in this case, in this case, the phonon that is reflected for, for, the, for the sake of this analogy. And the point is that this, this ratio, the R to S ratio, can be reconfigured by, uh, by tuning the, the, the power of the, of the control fields that you use. Now, of course, there's a, a load of applications for, uh, for beam splitters in regular optics. Inter two, two beams will interfere at a beam splitter, as, as you well know with, with uh, you know, applications in uh, remote sensing, precision distance measurement, gravitational waves, et cetera, et cetera. And people in the quantum optics community get very excited about beam splitters as well. Uh, you can use them to generate superpositions, entanglements, multi-photon states, and there's, there's a, a whole host of um, applications in, in computing communications and sensing. So yeah, the, the, the question I'd like to ask is, well, you know, can, can you see these kind of interference effects that one sees at a regular optical beam splitter? Can you see them at, the, at this quantum memory beam splitter? Um, and if you could, well, then you could generate sort of hybrid uh, quantum states, you know, photon-phonon entanglement, uh, stuff like that. So 
The way this would work is you, you have uh, two time bins that you're uh, attempting to store in the memory, and the first time bin is, is just the same as before. You, you, you write, you write a, uh, a, a photon into the memory, but then in the second time, time bin, you're putting in another strong pulse, which simultaneously is trying to write the second photon into the memory, but it is also trying to read the first photon out of the memory. And what happens is you end up with interference in the second time bin that, I, that I've circled in green there. Um, and so what, what that, what that, the implication of that is that you can, you can interfere two photons at a beam splitter even when they don't arrive at the beam splitter at the same time. And I think, I, I certainly think there's applications for that. If, if you could get the memory lifetime a bit longer than three and a half gigaseconds, there's very interesting applications for that. Um, so the first experiment we did was, was fairly simple. I would call this uh, one photon interference. So we, we take a, a single photon from the source, uh, we split it into two time bins, and you can vary, the, vary the, the separation between the time bins, and we store each mode in the memory. Uh, and then as we scan the delay between the two time bins, we see very clear uh, interference fringes. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that these, the interference fringes that I've zoomed in on B, C, and D up there, um, they oscillate at 40 terahertz, which is the frequency of the phonon, not at you know, 300 and whatever terahertz, which is the frequency of, of, of the photon. So it's clear here that the, the interference has been mediated by the phonon uh, and it's not optical in nature. And then of course the other smoking gun for that is the fact that it decays with this characteristic lifetime uh, of, of the optical phonon. Uh, the next thing that we did is we, we tried to, to do more like what I, what I sketched in the, the, the first slide there, uh, so storing uh, two photons inside of the memory. So in this case, the, the first photon in T1 was just an attenuated coherent state or a weak coherent pulse, uh, and then a true single photon came in in the, in the, the second time bin there. Uh, and then the, uh, the analogy, I guess the, the optical analogy is drawn in, in the bottom right there. Uh, so you bring in a coherent state on the first beam splitter that reflects off the first beam splitter, uh, generating a, a coherent state of, of, of the optical phonon mode. Uh, and then you arrive at the second beam splitter uh, with, a, with a true single photon, and you expect these to, to interfere at a beam splitter in the sense that you will get uh, Hong and Mandel bunching, so you'll end up with two photons uh, leaving the memory or two phonons remaining uh, in the memory. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, we, we measure a Hong and Mandel peak uh, with a visibility of, of 59%. Uh, and the reason we have to measure, this is, this is basically the, the, the increase in two photon events uh, due to the Hong and Mandel bunching. Uh, the, the classic signature of Hong and Mandel is, the, uh, is the, the, the Hong and Mandel dip. But of course, to measure the Hong and Mandel dip with, this, with the, the, the light matter beam splitter, we would have to have a way of measuring the, the single phonon. So we didn't do that, and instead we just measured an, an increase in, in two photon events. Uh, so this was, again, clear evidence that, uh, that we, were, we were doing non-classical interference at, at this, this beam splitter. Uh, and at the time, this was the, the second ever demonstration of Hong and Mandel in, in a non-photonic system. Uh, well, there's, there's been a few others since, uh, since we did this. Uh, the, second, the second thing that we did was use the, the quantum memory as a way of converting the, the frequency or and the bandwidth of, of single photons. Uh, so uh, the, that's the energy level diagram for, for the, the right step. Uh, and in all the work I've talked about up until now, the right pulse has been the same wavelengths as the read pulse, um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Because we're so far away from resonance with, with the conduction band, uh, we're free to choose a different read pulse that can have a, a different wavelength, different bandwidth, et cetera. Uh, and the, the change of, 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 of the spectral properties of the read pulse is directly mapped onto the, the spectral properties of, of the output photon. So we can change uh, both the, the wavelength and the bandwidth of the photon uh, using the quantum memory. And uh, we, sh we showed that we can blue and red shift uh, by a, you know, roughly 10 nanometers or so in each direction. Uh, and also we can, uh, compared to the input, which is in green, uh, we can also uh, decrease the bandwidth from five nanometers down to two nanometers or increase it from five up to 12. Um, and I wanted to use this slide as, as a way to sort of segue into the next section of my talk, because here we, we're using a quantum memory in order to convert the frequency of light. Uh, and in the next part of my talk, we're going to be converting the frequency of light in order to build a quantum memory. Uh, so that's this, uh, this storage with intracavity frequency translation. Um, and uh, before I, I launch off into that, I'm going to start with a, a, a very quick primer on, on Bragg scattering Fourier mixing, which is, which is the, the technique we use for, um, for converting the color of light. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll start this section with an apology. It's never good to, to start with an apology, but I guess it's good to get it out of the way at least. Uh, I will be flipping from frequency space to wavelength space at least once, I, th I think only once, um, just because the mass is, is kind of easier in frequency space, but uh, I never know how many terahertz my laser beams are, so I'm gonna switch to nanometer space qu quite quickly. Uh, and then the other, the other apology is that, is that we use these labels R and T somewhat interchangeably, um, so, so that, that may get confusing. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Bragg scattering Fourier mixing looks like this. So what you've got is, is a, um, a pair of strong pump pulses, P and Q in, in, uh, in purple and blue here, uh, and an input single photon, which is, which is in red there. And what you're doing is you're using these strong control pulses to change the, the, the frequency of the single photon. Uh, now, of course, this, this process has to obey energy conservation. Um, so that the energy of, of, uh, of S and P has to add up to the energy of, of Q and R. And what, and what that means is that the, the frequency difference, little delta between P and Q is directly mapped to the, the frequency difference between the, the signal and the, uh, the, the converted light R. Uh, and then this process will happen, uh, needs to be phase matched in order to happen efficiently. So you also have to make sure that the K vectors all add up and that, that's the second equation there at the right. Uh, so you have, to, you have to find a way of simultaneously solving these two equations. Uh, and if, you're, if, you're, if your fiber is polarization maintaining, then you can use the birefringence in, inherent in the, in the core to achieve relatively broadband um, frequency conversion. But in that case, the, the small delta is fixed, but you're free to, to mess around with the big delta. Um, and in regular fiber, the, the fields can be placed on, on opposite sides of zero dispersion to achieve phase matching. Um, in, in that case, you're free to play around with little delta, but you're somewhat constrained in, in, in big delta. Uh, and then the real point with this is that it's, it's entirely reversible. So once you've converted S to R, you can convert R back to S. And that's, that's basically the secret of how the, the quantum memory works. So uh, walking through how, uh, how the protocol works. So you, you start, and it, as advertised, I've immediately switched to wavelength. Um, so you, you basically have a dichroic, high refle highly reflective cavity set up in an optical fiber. So it's, it's literally just a single continuous piece of fiber. There's, there's no active elements inside it. There's, there's nothing else but fiber. And then you put high reflectors on either end of the fiber. Uh, and the high reflectors, they're, they're, um, they're dichroic. So they, they transmit some wavelengths and they're highly reflected for other wavelengths. In this case, it is a, uh, a short pass filter. Uh, and then you, so you start off with your fields, uh, P, Q, and S are all transmit through, through the, uh, the end mirror and they end up in, in, inside of the fiber. And then once they're, in, once they're inside of the fiber, the frequency pro conversion process starts and S begins to convert to R. And then once, you, once your photon is at wavelength R, it's now resonant with the cavity and it just bounces backwards and forwards inside of the, inside of the cavity. Uh, for as long as, as, uh, as it will stay there for. And then when you want to recall the memory, uh, recall the photon from the memory, you just do the exact reverse process. You come in with the, uh, the control fields P and Q and a, and a signal photon at, at frequency S is, is spat back out again. And, uh, and that's the way it works. Um, I mean, it feels like I'm apologizing a lot today. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we tried, I think, nearly 100 of these cavities in, with various different fibers, mirrors, uh, lengths, phase matching conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've done my best to try and distill that to three dis distinct types of cavity, uh, and I'll, I'll walk through them one by one. So the first is a, a single piece of fiber. Um, it's, in this case, it's a polarization maintaining fiber from a company called Fibercore, uh, and we've, put, we've coated the ends of the fiber with, with dielectric stacks. Uh, and then that's the, uh, the, the particular phase matching conditions that we're able to achieve a uh, um, phase match for near infrared storage. So uh, the photons are around about 900 nanometers that get converted from 903 to 925 and then back again. Uh, the round trip time of the cavity is 12 and a half nanoseconds and the pulse duration is, is two picoseconds. Uh, so this is the one I'm gonna talk about first and then I'll, I'll introduce the other two later when we get to them. Uh, so the, the first way that we try to characterize this cavity is, is literally just by slamming a bright laser into the end of it and, and measuring the pulses as they ring down. So you can see that on the, the, the top left there, put a bright pulse in at lambda R. Most of it will just be reflected, but a little bit of it, of it will leak in, into the cavity. And then 
every time that that bounces backwards and forwards in the cavity, a little bit, a little bit of it will leak out of the back, and we can detect that with fast detectors. And we measure one of these, what we call ring down curves, which allows us to measure the, the Q of the cavity or, if, or, or, or the lifetime, the number of round trips, whatever you want to call it. Um, in this case, uh, we measure up to around 80 round trips. Uh, although, of course, because, the, uh, because of the, the nature of the, the, the coatings that we put on the cavity, the number, of, the number of round trips does depend upon the, uh, the wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, uh, the, the, the more round trips we get. Now, unfortunately, this, the edge is not super sharp. So as we, st and the, the, um, we're only able to achieve a you know, relatively small frequency shift of, of 20 nanometers or so. So as we, we would like to move our further and further into the, the reflective uh, part of the, of, the, of the coating there, but we're not able to do that because at some point we start to lose too much of the input signal. So there's, there's kind of a trade-off to be had between, uh, between the, the transmi transmission losses of the signal and the, the round trip time. So this is, this is what the experimental setup looks like for, the, for this particular cavity. So we, we started with a, a one kilohertz laser system um, and we, we applied various spectral filtering uh, and whatnot to, um, to, to set up the, the, the three the three relevant fields. Um, and because the, the laser repetition rate was only one kilohertz, we, act, we have to physically delay the, the read pulses with this delay line on the, on the top left up there. Uh, and that's quite limiting because it's fairly impractical, but also it means we couldn't investigate more than one round trip. Um, but no, nevertheless, we were able to, 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 to do some interesting stuff. So we, we first of all attenuated the input pulse to the single photon level. These weren't true single photons like in the, the, in the previous slide. They were just single photon level pulses. Uh, and we see that we're able to, to achieve a write efficiency of, of 95%, uh, which means most, you know, nearly all of the light is, is, is mapped into the cavity. Unfortunately, as before, we are generating some noise. Uh, in this case, because the, uh, the pumps are to the blue of the signal, and this noise is predominantly um, uh, stimulated Raman scattering. Um, but we do think we could get rid of that if we're able to build the, the cavity the other way around. Um, and then 12, actually 12.7 nanoseconds later, uh, we come in with a second pair of pulses to do the read step, uh, and we can recall some, some light from the, the cavity, and the, the efficiency is pretty good. Uh, the, the, the overall efficiency for this, this first uh, round trip is, is 73%. Uh, and then the final thing we do is we, we measure what we call the, the spectral fidelity, which is just essentially just the overlap integral between the input spectrum and the output spectrum. And we see it's, it's significantly bigger than 99. So on, on the, the, the right-hand graph there in purple, we've plotted one minus the fidelity, and you can see it goes down to below 10 to the negative three. So, th so the, the spectrum of the photons is, is pretty much exactly maintained throughout the, the frequency conversion, the, the, the two frequency conversion processes. Um, so then the, the next type of cavity that we, we've tried is uh, we've replaced the high reflective mirrors with, uh, with a pair of commercial fiber Bragg gratings that we've then spliced together in the middle to, to, to turn into a cavity. The fiber is, is uh, non-polarization maintaining uh, 1060 XP fiber, which is very cheap. You can just buy from Thor Labs. Um, and in this case, the phase matching is, uh, is set up for telecom storage. So the, uh, the input photons are about 1585 nanometers. The, uh, the, the narrow FPG reflection band is at 1547.2. Uh, and then that, the phase matching conditions dictate that the two controls need to be in the O band, so 1310 and uh, 1337. This cavity is a little bit longer. It's 50 nanoseconds round trip time and the pulse duration is also a bit longer at, at 10 picoseconds. So again, we, we start off by characterizing the, uh, the lifetime with the, this ring down uh, technique, and it's significantly worse than the first cavity. Uh, it's only about 10 round trips, uh, and we believe that the dominant loss mechanism is, is this, just a splice in between the two gratings, although it's, if anyone has any ideas how we could measure that, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, the, then we continue with the, the, the characterization as before. So we measure the, the reflectivity of the mirror just by scanning a, a tunable continuous wave laser, laser across it. And you can see it's a very narrow reflector, so only about um, 0.2 nanometers bandwidth. And the, the lifetime that one can achieve in the memory uh, it, you know, depends on wavelengths in, in a way that you'd expect. So it gets, gets lower as you, as you move out of the, the band of the reflectors. Uh, so then th this setup was a bit different. So in this case, the, uh, the master laser works at 80 megahertz, uh, and you derive the P and Q and S fields from the same laser. Um, 
the, uh, th th this is important because it means you can demonstrate readout from multiple different bins. So we we're able to see how, it, see how the memory works uh, for, for several round trips of the cavity. However, the, the round trip time of the cavity is, is not resonant with the round trip time of, of the laser. So, every, so we still have to have this annoying delay line up in the top left up here. So you need to know how many round trips you want to have before you, before you put the photon in, which is, which is obviously, again, kind of impractical. Uh, but nevertheless, it was, we were able to make some, some useful measurements. So what we're doing here is, uh, again, attenuating the input pulse to the, to the single photon level, um, and then measuring the, the, the readout uh, at various different round trip times. Uh, and at every round trip time, we, we're scanning the, uh, the read photon delay in order to, to do a cross correlation. Uh, and that tells us about, the, uh, about how, how well the, the memory is, uh, is storing the photon. And the important thing to show here is that um, the, the cross correlation is pretty much exactly the same for the first round trip as it is for the fifth round trip. So, so the, it's, it's a low dispersion cavity and the, the photon is, is not being too badly messed up by in, in the storage process. Um, and I just wanted to I, I put a note more to myself than to you to, to, to mention the scale. So you could, I, on, the, uh, on the main graph there, um, we have of course zoomed into every every pulse so you can see what's going on. Uh, in practice, the, uh, the, the photons are more, you know, 10 picoseconds in duration, as I said, and the lifetime is, is measured in microseconds there. Uh, and uh, again, as, as with the, the previous memory, we are generating some noise from, from Raman scattering, and that's shown in, in red there, although the signal-to-noise ratio at the single photon level is, is already quite promising. Uh, and the final type of cavity that, that I want to talk about uh, is Similar in many ways to, to the second cavity, only in this case, we, uh, we've, with the help of our colleagues in the Fiber Bragg Group at NRC, uh, we made homemade mirrors instead of, instead of uh, buying them commercially. Uh, and the, you know, the big advantage of this is there's no splice loss in the middle, so that the lifetime should improve. Uh, and we also made some attempts to try and increase the, the bandwidth of the memory, uh, although you, as, you, as, you, as you'll come to see, it maybe didn't work as well as, as we hoped. Um, so we, uh, again, Sorry if this is repetitive, but we measured, measured the ring down. Uh, and this, as we hope, the lifetime is much better. It's more like 50 round trips instead of, uh, instead of 10. And we believe the dominant loss mechanisms in this case are just simply leaking through the, the, the mirrors and also a little bit of, of scattering from the FPG. Uh, so the, the mirror, uh, we, we set up these uh, chirped brag racing mirrors. And it had the desired effect of increasing the, the bandwidth of the mirror. Uh, although, as you can see in, in red there, the lifetime of the cavity didn't increase in the way that, that we would hope. Uh, and we, when I say we, I mean the colleagues in, in the Bragg rating group that know more about this than me, uh, believe that that's because we're getting some coupling from the, the core mode into the cladding mode, which is reducing the, the bandwidth of the, cav of the cavity in to, to, sort of to the left of that, uh, of that line. So the, the bandwidth has increased a little bit, so 0.5 nanometers instead of 0.2, but it hasn't increased by as much as we, as we hoped it would do. Um, and then the, 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 the next important thing that we, that we did with this cavity is we tried to make it resonant with the laser, as I mentioned before. Uh, and this, this has a, a number of obvious advantages. You know, the, the big advantage is, is that you can, you, can choose your, you can choose your read pulses. Once the photon is in the memory, you can choose how long to keep it in there for, rather than having to fix it before you even put the, the photon in. So that, that's the big advantage. Then you can also imagine that the round trip time can actually be many multiples of the laser round trip time. And then that, that allows you to do sort of parallel storage and processing um, with many different laser pulses. And the, the way we achieved this, so we, we did our absolute best to make the cavity exactly the same length as the laser cavity. We didn't quite get there. Um, so then what we do, it'd be hard to do without a laser pointer. But um, the, the picture there, uh, what we did is on the, the top left, uh, we clamped the two ends of the fiber. And then on the, the bottom right, the, the fiber is wrapped around a little barrel that's free to rotate. And then we just applied a little bit of tension on the, on the barrel to stretch the fiber. And that way, we were able to stretch the, the fiber into resonance with the cavity. That actually worked really nicely. So here, here's a plot of the cavity, cavity frequency, which is obviously one over the round trip time, as a function of stage position on, on that stretcher. And it can be tuned into resonance with, with the um, with the laser cavity quite e easily with a rate of about 0.2 megahertz per, per millimeter. So in this way, we were able to, to get the cavity into resonance. Uh, and that 
uh, in principle, greatly simplifies the setup, of course. You just have to have a, a single Pocker cell that can pick the, the, the read and write pulses. Uh, and that allows us to arbitrarily choose how many round trips we'd like to store the photon for. Um, that being said, the very first thing we want to do, of course, is to characterize how the memory behaves. So we switch straight back to the, uh, the setup I showed you on the previous slide uh, and did this, this cross-correlation trick again that, that, I, that I talked about. Um, so we measured the, the cross-correlation um, for over 30 round trips of, of the fiber. Uh, and then this was actually also kind of nice. We could, we could sit the, uh, the read pulse on the, in this case, the third bin, and then just stretch the fiber and see the, uh, see the cavity coming into resonance with the laser. So we're able to, in, you know, in real time, kind of tune, tune it up. Um, and then as you can, you can probably already see, but I'll, I'll zoom in just, just to be completely sure. Um, unfortunately, the, the cross correlation, unlike the previous cavity, the, the cross correlation does get degraded as a, as a function of storage time. So you start off in the first bin with something that is nice and Gaussian, uh, and by the, by the uh, I think this is the, yeah, the 30th bin, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty messed up. And we think this is due to some, the, the two gratings have a huge amount of second order dispersion, but they, they should be matched and cancel out. But we think there's a, a fair amount of residual uh, third order correlation. And this, this sort of oscillating uh, pattern there is fairly, fairly characteristic of third order uh, uh, dispersion. And then the other thing that you can probably see is that the, the efficiency of, of the readout process kind of oscillates as you go along. Uh, we believe that's due to some, some polarization, polarization issues as well with the reflector. So it's, uh, it's not perfect, but, uh, but I think we're getting there. So I'll return to the, my sort of overview of the three different types of cavities, and I've, I've tried to highlight the pros and cons of each cavity in, in red and green there. Uh, so the, the first one has a long lifetime and a high bandwidth because it's a, a dielectric mirror. Um, and the mirrors also have low dispersion, but we haven't got it to work in the telecom yet. Uh, and then of course, that means that the, the fiber itself is fairly dispersive in, in the near infrared. Uh, the, the, the second cavity works in the telecom, which is great. Uh, has low dispersion mirrors, but also a, a you know, modest lifetime and a, and a modest bandwidth as well. We solved the lifetime problem with our homemade FPGs, but we also introduced a, a bunch of other problems with, with the dispersion uh, and also with this, this polarization issue. Um, but it, importantly, uh, we're able to show that you, it's possible to tune this type of cavity into resonance with, with the laser. Uh, so I want to finish up with some conclusions. So I've, I've shown you that we can store broadband single photons in the optical phonon modes of diamond. Uh, and shown that this type of quantum memory uh, can perform frequency manipulations and also beam splitter type operations. Uh, and I've shown that the fiber cavities are a promising route to, to long, longer lifetime quantum memories. Uh, and we see kind of early, early applications of this type of memory being in, in synchronizing multiple phot photon sources. Uh, and longer term, we're interested in looking at um, memory-based quantum processing. Um, I want to finish up by thanking my wonderful group. Um, it's been far too long since we've all been in the same place together, so I, uh, we don't have a picture of us all smiling outside of the NRC. Instead, I've decided to, to break it down by, uh, by the, the, the projects that people are working on. So Kent Bonsworth-Fisher and, and Phil Bustard uh, worked with me on the, the quantum memory stuff. Uh, and, I, and we also, that, that little team doubles up as a quantum frequency conversion team. Uh, and I encourage you to go and check out Kent's uh, poster presentation about broadband quantum frequency conversion. Uh, Kate, Fred, and Andrew um, work on ultra-fast all optical switching with, with various quantum, um, quantum optics applications. And again, Kate has a poster which I encourage you to check out. Uh, we've also got a quantum imaging team with, with Braden, Yingwen, and, and Guillaume. Uh, we couldn't do any of this, obviously, without our wonderful technical staff, Denis, uh, Runa, and Doug. And, uh, and of course, last but by no means least, uh, Ben is the, the group leader who kind of glues this whole, whole thing together. Um, outside of our group, we have uh, wonderful collaboration with, uh, with the Fiber Brag Rating Group, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, and also with uh, our theoretical friends. who are, They're real friends. They're, they're not theoretical, uh, but they work on, on theory <laughs> problems. Um, and with that, I'll... Uh, I'm nearly finished. Uh, we, we are interested in, in hiring pretty much at any, any level of, of, the, uh, of the spectrum. So if you're a young if you're a student or a young postdoc and you, you've, you've been interested by any of this stuff and you want to work in a, in a cool old building with, with, uh, with cool equipment, then, then get in touch with myself or with Ben. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.
fantastic <laughs> talk, and we are open for questions now. I'll let you think for a couple this of minutes. There. Uh, first of all, very nice. Very nice talk. It was it was quite easily to understand. I appreciate that for a non quantum person. Um, the diamond stuff was really cool. I'm sort of wondering if there's any hope of increasing the lifetime of this phonon, for example, with phononic crystals or something like that. Uh, it's it's a good point uh, and it, one I get asked a lot. I, I yeah I think sort of one D confinement and stuff may increase the lifetime. I, I very much doubt it would increase it to a, a practically useful level. Um, you, know, you, might, you might be able to get from three picoseconds to you know, 100 picoseconds or something like that, but I, I, I doubt you'd be able to get to the sort of microsecond kind of time scale that we're interested in. And the, the point with these longer, longer lifetimes is that you're free to kind of make decisions on electronic time scales while the, the photon is, is digging around in a cavity, so you, you really want to be getting to as I said, microseconds or so to, to be practically useful. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Duncan. So uh, one question that I had, it was regarding the, the case when you, you use the memory with two photon cases and one was attenuated coherent state, mm -hmm. and then the other one was a single photon one. Yeah. So if I look at the coalescence, the coalescence was about the visibility, I mean, the peak visibility that you had, it was about 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not get that quite well. So why it was 60%? I mean, usually it's, it should really go even high, if, even if you have deficiencies in the system. Yeah, no, that's, it's so that you're right, it should go up to 100%. Uh, Two reasons for that. The, the, um, the, the simple one is that some noise does get introduced into the memory, not, not a whole lot. Um, and then the other, the other, the other reason is um, you know, spectral and temporal identicalness of, of the photon. So the, the, the weak coherent state is not perfectly identical. Uh, we, we did test that by just trying to interfere them at a regular beam splitter. We got a little bit higher uh, from memory it was mid to high 60s um, rather than 59, but it, it certainly didn't go all the way to 100. And as I said, we, we attribute that to them not being identical. Uh, great talk, Duncan. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned about efficiencies. I uh, just, what's the, does that include the conversion efficiencies of the three schemes that you talked about? What, what are the conversion efficiencies for the uh, 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 forward mixing? So for, for the three cavities? First one, uh, I, you know what, I, I realized I didn't put it up for the, the second two. Sorry, I should have done that. Uh, first one was, was yeah, mid-70s. Uh, the, the next one was, yeah, closer to 10, 15 percent, something like that. Uh, and that is purely and simply because the core is, of the fiber is bigger, so the nonlinearity is, is lower. Um, and also, the, in the first one, we were using uh, an amplified laser, so you have literally all the power that you want. The second ones, we're using these, these oscillators with less power. And there's, there's also an annoying problem, which is that the, you need a way to combine the, the P and Q fields. Um, and they're close enough together in a region where there's not very good dichroic mirrors. Uh, so we just we, we lost half the power just there. And the way that the efficiency scales, that, that means that it scales with the power squared. So we, we, we're losing four times the, the efficiency that we could get. So I should mention, we, are, uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, we, I've never heard of a conference that's ahead of time. We're always behind schedule. But, uh, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for discussion. Uh, and uh, we broaden out the discussion a little bit. And let me, uh, let, let me ask one of these questions. You were using a synthetic iron. Yeah. Question, uh, is it technologically feasible is it technologically feasible to uh, have gemstones made by this uh, uh, artificial deposition? <laughs> You're thinking of a present for your wife, Bob? Or <laughs> um, I I don't know a whole lot about. I, I would have thought so. Yeah. Bloomberg's yeah. wife had a ruby uh, <laughs> uh, necklace. 
Uh, because one of his mazers was in uh, Ruby. <laughs> yeah. I, honestly, we, we just bought them. I, I don't know. I, I would, have, would have thought anything that is made of yeah, pure, car pure carbon, like diamond, would, is easy enough. Something that, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Great question. What I've heard is that the chemical companies uh, went, to a, went into an unholy alliance with uh, De Beers and the companies of that sort. Uh, they promised not to make uh, diamond samples that would be useful for gemstones. That, that, oh, yeah, I, I've heard that through the grapevine. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. Yeah, no, I, I don't know either. Um, but what, I mean, from a practical point of view, the, um, the natural diamonds were very bioinfringent, we found. Um, and so for any of these processes that required phase matching was, was a nightmare. Uh, so the, 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 the stone that we used for the memory was, was very, very pure and very, made very slowly. It's still bioinfringent. Uh, sorry, yes, the, the, yeah, the, it was, it's bioinfringent, but it's bioinfringent in, in a constant way throughout the crystal. Uh, whereas the other the other ones had oh, sort of, yeah, as a function position. Yeah, 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 as a function position, but also as a function of depth in the crystal, which which was yeah. disastrous for what we were trying you, to do. You really would not want that. No, exactly. Yeah. Question here. So one of the other things that we do in Ottawa are uh, short pulses and nanosecond pulses. Um, so. Do you foresee any use uh, of these kind of pulses to increase the, the number of pulses in your bin, in your time bin? So instead of increasing the lifetime uh, and you know, what those concerns will be, for example, the bandwidth of these pulses or the short wavelength of these pulses and things like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really interesting question, Julio. I, um, I, I think, Obviously, in anything fiber-based, the dispersion is just going to ruin you. Um, but maybe in some of these, these other systems, yeah. Um, if you are mapping to a material excitation, then the, the energy gap between the ground state and the excited state needs to be you know, roughly two to three times the, the, the bandwidth of the pulse you're trying to use. So I, I think you, with some of your really broadband pulses, you'd, you'd run into trouble with that. Um, the other interesting thing about using shorter pulses is, is of course, if you're, if you're wanting to do manipulations inside of the memory, um, you, if, if you have a, you know, a cavity, the shorter your pulse, the, 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 more, the more you could, you, know, you could apply a phase flip or, or something like that uh, with an intense pulse. Whether you'd want to go to all the way down, down to the acid second regime, I, I don't know. My, my guess is that all the dispersion management stuff would end up being a, a real nightmare, um, as, you, as you well know. <laughs> 